This is part two about the construction of the St. John's Bridge near Portland, Oregon. In part one, we covered site choice, foundations, and erecting the towers. In this part, we will continue picking up with the cables, the truss and road deck, and the recent renovation. The defining structural element of a suspension bridge is the cable. It ends up carrying the weight of the road deck and traffic, which it transfers to the tower and anchorages. Roebling and Sons was the contractor chosen to provide the cables, as they have for many bridges. This page from their catalog shows their wire products for suspension bridges. In most large bridges, the cables are spun in place, laying one wire at a time parallel to one another. That would be the top wire. A group of wires is gathered together to make a bundle. Taking a number of bundles and binding them together makes the main cable. In this case, there was a twist on the usual practice, literally, as the individual wires were twisted into a bundle, here called a strand. That would be the middle illustration. Each strand bundle was pre-made at the factory in New Jersey, rolled onto large wooden spools, and shipped to the site. Here we are seeing a section of the main cable. Each strand is one and a half inches in diameter. In total, each cable contains 91 such strands. Once in place, the cable bundles were coated with red lead paste. Wooden spacers were added to round out the shape. The hole was then wrapped in galvanized wire and painted. The diameter of the finished cable is 16 and 3 quarter inches. Each cable has a breaking strength of over 13,000 tons. Compare that to the maximum expected load of 4,200 tons and you should feel pretty safe. Using the twisted strands reduced construction time, thus saving significant budget. When the cables reach the anchorages, they separate back into individual strands which are attached to the anchor plates and chains. The anchorage structure and the ground counter the massive pull of the cable. Here we are showing the cables in place and the hanger ropes being added. Here is a photo showing the supporting wooden structures are gone. The cables are in place on the towers. Look carefully and you can see the hanger ropes dangling in space waiting for the road truss. The last phase is building the road. This has two parts and involves several steps. First, there are the parts on land, the approaches. They are built on the steel and concrete piers. The suspended part of the road is supported by a pair of steel trusses, one on each side of the road. These trusses are what give support and stiffness to the roadway. The truss is 18 feet deep. The trusses are attached to the cable by the hanger ropes. In this photo you can see the cable at the top with two hanger ropes coming down toward you. They are attached to the truss by the socketed ends. Cross beams go from truss to truss at the places where the hanger ropes are attached. On top of the cross beams are smaller beams parallel to the road called stringers. Then forms are placed and concrete is poured. The original roadway was a reinforced concrete slab seven inches thick. In this bridge, the trusses are spaced 52 feet apart, center to center. That allows room for a 40 foot wide roadway which makes four 10-foot wide vehicle lanes and a five-foot wide sidewalk on each side. Here is the suspended span being attached to the hanger ropes. And so, in four basic steps, the bridge is constructed and ready for traffic. This photo shows the just finished bridge, though there are still a few construction items in view. Looking at the timeline gives us a good way to make a quick review. Construction started in September of 1929. The various foundation parts were completed by the following April. By September of 1930, the towers were up. By January of 1931, the cables were in place. And by the middle of May 1931, the road deck and concrete work was finished. For a total construction time, of 21 and a half months. Opening day, however, was held off a month to coincide with the annual Portland Rose Festival. 
the official opening made by Rose Queen Rachel. And so St. John's and the Bridge lived happily ever after. Well, for a while, anyway. For structures to last, they require care and maintenance. These photos from the Oregon Department of Transportation show that after 70 years of service, the bridge was showing signs of wear and tear. Paint was flaking, steel was rusting, and concrete was deteriorating. So, to bring things up to date, starting in 2003, the bridge underwent a major renovation. These photos from ODOT show the two-and-a-half-year project, which included complete replacement of the road deck and sidewalks, repainting, lighting upgrade, and ramp improvement. Final cost, $42 million. When that was finished in September of 2005, the bridge was restored to its handsome old self. Appropriately, there was a reopening celebration, but alas, this time without the Rose Queen. Let's stand back and take a look at the bridge. The towers are 400 feet high. The main span of the bridge between the tower centers is 1,207 feet. Each of the side spans is 430 feet. Clearance for shipping from water level to the steel truss at the center is 205 feet. Since we began with a quote from David Steinman, the designing engineer, it seems appropriate to close with another one. This is too long to read the whole thing, but the thought is captured in the beginning and end. Quote, it is sincerely hoped by the designers that the St. John's Bridge will establish a new mark in artistic bridge design. End quote. There are two other videos. In one, we present the design of the bridge in Steinman's words. In the other, we make a visit to this hidden gem.